Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier podcast. Today, we're going to go deep in talking about meditation. Now, meditation is something that we have touched on in many different episodes on this show, but we've never really went too deep into it. And today, I'm really excited to actually go deep and talk more in depth about meditation. Now, this was a listener requested topic. So Michael Venzer, he sent in a request for actually sent in a question about meditation. And I thought it deserved a full episode. So I decided to bring on the leading expert in meditation for high performance. And that is Emily Fletcher. So Emily Fletcher is the founder of Ziva and the Ziva Meditation Technique. Like I said, she's the leading expert in meditation for high performance. So she has taught some of the brightest minds in entertainment, in business, CEOs, Navy SEALs, entertainers, and everything in between, how to meditate for high performance. Now, I brought her on today, and she just so happens to have a recently launched book called Stress Less and Accomplish More, which is incredible, by the way. I'm about halfway through it right now, and it's just, it's so good. You know, I think we all know that meditation is good for us, but this sort of just, you know, if you're not meditating by the time you you finish this book, I, I don't know if you'll ever meditate because it makes such a compelling case for actually meditating. And it really goes into some of the research and the many benefits that meditation can offer us. I know I thoroughly enjoyed this interview and I learned so much from her and from her book, Stress Less, Accomplish More. So if you're interested in meditation or you're someone who wants to do it but can't find the time or you know you should but you don't really know how, this is definitely worth checking out. I can tell you that personally, over the years, I've dabbled in meditation, but I've never made it a daily practice like Emily has or some other people that I know. And, you know, to be honest, it's just excuses. And I really don't have a good excuse. I can use the excuse that I don't have time, but we all know that that's a pretty lame excuse because we all have the same amount of hours in a day. It's just our priorities that dictate what we do with those hours. So I'm calling my own bullshit. And after this episode, I'm committing to meditate. So I'll keep you posted on how that goes. I'll be keeping track in my Be Healthy Everyday Planner. And I'll definitely keep you guys updated on Instagram as well. So I hope that this also inspires you to pick up a daily meditation practice. Now, before we get started, I'd like to share with you a couple brands that I love and help make this podcast possible. Before we get to the interview, I want to take a moment to share with you about a brand that helps make the Happier and Healthier podcast possible. If you're looking to improve your health, and especially if you're looking to improve your digestive health, you have to check out Hyperbiotics Pro 15 Probiotic. This probiotic is the most effective probiotic that I've found on the market, and it's clinically shown to be 15 times more effective than the common probiotic capsules that you'll find at the health food store. If you suffer from regular bloating, gas, or irregularity, definitely consider taking a high-quality probiotic to help. You can learn more at hyperbiotics.com and use the code HYPERMARIA for 20% off your order. Do you want to eat fresh, healthy, organic meals at home, but don't have the time to cook? Then you have to check out Sakara, an organic, plant-based, gluten-free meal delivery service that will deliver chef-prepared meals straight to your door. All the work is done for you, so you just have to open the package and eat or reheat. These are not frozen meals, but rather fresh-made and delivered twice a week. 
It's sort of like having a personal chef without having to pay a personal chef salary. You can use the code Maria M Love 15 on Sakara.com. That's S-A-K-A-R-A.com to get 15% off your order. So first off, Emily, congrats on your first book, Stress Less and Accomplish More. I, Thank you. Yeah, I just started reading it. I'm about halfway through and it's really blown away so far by all of the research and the information in there. So what is Stress Less and Accomplish More? How can we achieve that? Well, the thing is that most of us aren't, aren't aware of just how much stress is costing us. You know, because it's quite normal and it's quite pervasive in modern society, we just think that this is the way life is. We think it's normal to have insomnia or to need caffeine all day and to need alcohol all night. And we think it's normal to eat food that isn't food and and then wonder like, man, I wonder why this cancer epidemic is happening. You know, I wonder why everyone has ADHD. It's like we've sort of given away our power to these external diseases and like, oh, fingers crossed, hope I don't get that. And we're sort of like taking away or we don't realize just how much power we have over our own wellness, over our own stress. And what I like to say is if you're not managing your stress, your stress is managing you. And and where this is tricky is that a lot of people don't necessarily feel stressed per se. They may have had a great childhood. They may have been doing yoga and drinking green juice for a long time. But just being a human being on the planet earth these days, it's like, If you've ever taken a plane ride, if you've ever eaten a mango in the winter, if you've ever microwaved your food, if you've ever taken a red-eye flight, like that is stressing your body. It is asking your body to adapt. And so what I teach in the book and what I teach at Ziva are ways to give your body deep healing rest, rest that's actually five times deeper than sleep. And so not only do you feel more awake on the other side, but you actually are getting rid of that backlog of stresses that we've all been accumulating in our nervous system for our lifetimes. And then it's that eradication of the stress that allows us to perform at the top of our game. It's, it's having less stress in your brain and your body allows you to accomplish more. Yeah, I don't think there's one person on this planet Earth that would be like, no, I want to stress more and accomplish less. Like, it's just not, uh, that's not what we want, but it ends up what we're doing. So I think, you know, many of us in this wellness space, so most of the listeners here are definitely into healthy eating and nutrition and health and wellness. We all know that meditation is good for us, but the problem is most of us are still not doing it. And in the book, you actually dedicate it to anyone who tried meditation and think that they failed at it. So anyone who is in that camp, you know, that's listening, what advice do you have to them or or what should they know about meditation? Well, thank you for asking this. And you're right. I, I dedicated the book to anyone who's tried meditation and felt like a failure. And then I say, you're not a meditation failure. You just haven't been taught yet. And this book will teach you. And so my piece of advice would be, you know, know that meditation really is like any other skill. And just like a skill, you have to take the time to learn how to do it. Because meditation is simple, I think most of us assume we should already know how to do it. And then we sit down and we're like, okay, brain, stop thinking. And then inevitably we have a thought because the mind thinks involuntarily, just like the heart beats involuntarily. So trying to give your brain a command to shut up is as effective as trying to give your heart a command to stop beating. And so we're like, okay, well, this meditation thing is simple. So I'll just sit down. I'll clear my mind. All right, brain, shut up. Hmm, sure would like a snack. Snacks are delicious. Oh, now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking about how I'm thinking. I suck at meditation. I quit. And that's the beginning and the end of most people's meditation career. And it makes me sad because they potentially rob themselves of a lifetime of bliss and fulfillment and better performance because they're judging themselves based on misinformation. And so where this is becoming a bit of an epidemic is that As meditation is becoming more and more popular, people are, you know, like there's thousands of new meditation apps that come out every day. I get invited almost every day to be a guest teacher for some new VR meditation thing. And what most people are actually doing is mindfulness. So most of the apps out there, most of the drop-in studios, most of the YouTube videos are teaching what I would call mindfulness. Now, I would define mindfulness as the art of bringing your awareness into the present moment, which is very good for you. It's very necessary. It's very good at dealing with your stress in the now. But the meditation that I teach in the book and at Ziva is all about getting rid of your stress from the past. And so 
what that does is when you're giving your body that deep healing rest and you're getting rid of the stress from your past, you're going to see a very marked return on investment. You're going to see that you start to have more time in your day because your brain and body are performing as nature intended. And then you stop feeling like a failure because A, you're not judging yourself based on misinformation. You know the thoughts are not the enemy and you start getting better at life. And you start finding that your sleep is deeper, that your sex is better, your immune system is stronger, you're able to accomplish more in less time. And then you're like, oh, this meditation thing, it's, it's easy to make it non-negotiable and you stop feeling like a failure because you're judging yourself based on the right criteria. And a lot of people will ask me, well, how do I know if it's working? And the thing I say is your life will get better right? It's like, it's not going to be a question mark. You're not going to need like an app or a headband or like a body data monitoring device to tell you whether or not your meditation is working because you're going to know it because your life will get better. <laughs> and if it's not, then I would argue that you might want to change up the type of meditation that you're doing, right? Because like none of us have time to waste. So if you're doing 10 minutes of an app and it's like, okay, and you feel okay, but still you're like, oh, I'm too busy to meditate or I got to do this instead, then I would argue that what you're doing might not be a good fit for you. Right. And you know, it's so funny because the one thing that sticks out to me about you is your presence. So when I first met you many, many years ago, it was like you come into a room and you're just glowing and radiant and magnetic and you weren't really doing anything actively. Like you weren't calling for attention or anything like that. It was just your presence that you were just so calm and so peaceful and I don't know, blissed out, whatever it is that you just had this magnetic energy. And it was sort of like one of those things, which I know, you know, and from reading your book, a lot of people are like, okay, I'll have what she's having. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it, it does like once you're really meditating and you're doing it consistently on a regular basis, it does just sort of, I feel like radiate out of you. Yeah. And if you think about that, if you think about the people in your life that you want to hire to work on your team, that you want to date, that you want to start companies with, that you want to go on vacations together, like we all want to be with happy people. You know, we want to be with confident, kind, present, fun, funny people. This is who we want to choose to spend our time with. And we don't really like spending our time with stressy, anxious, fearful, speculative, jealous, insecure people. Like it just doesn't feel as good. And the thing is when we're stressed, we can't help but feel small and jealous and insecure and worried and speculative because that's what fear and stress does. It gets us stuck in the past and the future. And what meditation does is that it takes your right brain to the gym, which is the piece of you that's in charge of the right now. And our magic always happens right now. Our healing always happens now. Our bliss always happens now. And that's strangely a muscle, like present moment awareness, that presence, that mindfulness even, like that's a muscle. And if you're not taking that to the gym, then it's so easy to get caught up in the social media, like the social media spiral that we're all addicted to and, you know, looking at other people's successes, judging our failures by other people's successes. And it's just not sustainable and it's not enjoyable. And so I really appreciate you being a mirror and, and sharing that back to me. But just you noticing that about me probably is the reason why we're doing this podcast right now. And that was years and years ago. And so it's, it's just a beautiful example and illustrating effect that you don't have to work so hard. It's like if you're doing the work of taking care of yourself and meditating every day, twice a day, it may not be, you may not have to knock on so many doors to find a business partner or an investor or someone to date or someone to help you with your kids or whatever you're looking for. Like at the end of the day, life is built on relationships and people really truly want to interact with people who make them feel good. And the only way for you to make people feel good is for you to feel good. And oftentimes I think, especially as parents or as moms or as entrepreneurs, we think, well, if I can just take care of everyone else first, I'll just make sure my kids are okay and my husband's okay and my coworkers are okay and my boss is okay and everybody else needs me. And then we end up in this martyrdom cycle where we've given beyond what we are capable of and beyond what we want to. 
And then we don't have time left to fill ourselves up. And you can't pour from an empty cup. And then we're, we're sick, sad, and stressed. And then we make the people around us sick, sad, and stressed. And so even though it feels selfish to take time to meditate, I would argue that it's the least selfish thing that you can do. That your kids don't want you tired. Your husband doesn't want you angry. Your coworkers don't want you stupid. They need you performing at the top of your game. And the only way to do that is to make sure that you're managing your stress. Right. And in the book, you actually say stress makes you stupid, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so can you just share a little bit of that? Because I think, you know, especially in a place like New York City, I think, and I say this all the time, people don't realize how stressed out they are. You know, mm -hmm. people are just so used to that go, go, go mentality and that busyness, that constant busyness and doing more and more and more and filling up every second of their day. But they also feel like they can handle it. But why do we really need to slow down and stop and look at our life and really stop over stressing ourselves and putting ourselves in the situation where we're, we are, we're just in this constant state of stress and anxiety? Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely right. I think a lot of people don't realize how stressed they are. I liken stress to like the white noise in the background or it's like a TV being on in the other room and you don't know that it's on until it turns off. You're like, oh, I feel like I have so much more brain space. I feel like I can just hear myself think or, you know, I can just, there's more space. And if we want to understand what stress is actually doing to our brains and bodies, we have to cut back in time a few thousand years. Say we're hunting and gathering in the woods. Saber-toothed tiger jumps out with the intent to kill. Now, if that happens, your body's going to launch involuntarily into a fight or flight stress reaction. And then what will happen is that your digestion will flood with acid to shut down digestion because you need all hands on deck to fight or flee the tiger. That same acid will seep onto your skin so that you don't taste very good if you get bitten into by that tiger. Your bladder and bowels will evacuate so you can be light on your feet. Your immune system goes to the back burner because who cares if you're going to get cancer if you're about to be killed by a tiger. Adrenaline levels increase, cortisol levels increase, and this series of chemical reactions is very useful if your demands are tiger attacks. But if your demands are living in New York City or having kids or having deadlines or traffic, then this fight or flight thing has become maladaptive. It's now disallowing us from performing at the top of our game. And if you're in this chronic, low-grade, constant fight or flight, over time, that's what's making us stupid, sick, and slow. It's the accumulation of the backlog of stresses in our nervous system. And then over time, if your body is releasing adrenaline and cortisol, which are stress hormones, that also makes you acidic. And that acidity leads to inflammation. And inflammation, chronic inflammation, is the basis of all chronic disease. And so it's like if you start meditating... Not only are you getting rid of the adrenaline and cortisol, but you also start to flood your brain and body with dopamine and serotonin, which are alkaline in nature. And so your body, it becomes much easier for body to run a whole host of healing operations. And then you also, you're basically just not wasting so much of your mental and physical energy preparing for an imaginary tiger attack. Like the thing is, our demands are no longer predatory attacks. You know, like an iPhone and emails and text messages, like it is asking our bodies to adapt, but not in a life-threatening way. And P.S., this is why people say, well, exercise is my meditation, because they go to work, they get stressed, and then they go to the gym and they get on the treadmill and they get to outrun that tiger. Or they go to the boxing ring and they get to fight that tiger. And exercise is good enough to handle your stress from today you know, you can burn off like today's stress at the gym, but if you want to get rid of the dog that barked in your face when you were 12 or your parents divorced when you were 14, that's stuff that's been stored in your cellular and now we know epigenetic memory. If we want to get rid of that, then we have to give the body rest. We have to go in and de-excite the nervous system. And that's really what, where meditation's magic comes into play. Yeah, I found that so interesting in the book where you talk about how meditation helps us remove that stress from the past. And it's kind of like, how is this possible, right? If you're just sitting there with your eyes closed, you know, and I, I read a book recently, actually another woman, um, Lauren Zander, who was on the podcast and she's a life coach and she talks she's about- my life coach. No, is she really? Oh my yeah. God, I love her. <laughs> so she talks about how you have to like clean up all your lies, right? And you have to like actively clean up your mess, right? But then it kind of seems like this is a different approach where it's like with meditation, you kind of let your body or your mind do that internal cleaning on its own. 
Mm. Yeah. So interestingly, you know, I think that the work that Lauren does is so beautiful and so powerful. And I like in like life coaching and even religion and self-help books to like beautiful software upgrade. You know, it's the operating system and we need elegant operating systems if we want to really play big in the world. The what where I see meditation playing into that is that it's like the hardware upgrade. It's the thing that's going in and defragging your brain computer so that you can run whatever software you have. You know, a lot of us aren't choosing to lie to people. Like we do it like when we get scared or we want to fight or flee, you know, or we just want to tell someone what they want to hear to avoid a conflict because we're so scared of fight or flight. You know, we're either in it or we're trying to avoid it. And so, yeah, just like she goes back and makes you like clean up all your lies from your past. It's like the meditation goes in and cleans out all the times you've been in fight or flight. And because it's left like a little open window on your brain machine, it's actually something called a premature cognitive commitment. And by the time the average American, actually that might not be American, it might be adult just on the planet earth, but let's just say American to be safe. By the time the average American is 20 years old, we have approximately 10 million of those open windows on our brain machine, 10 million premature cognitive commitments. And it's like having 10 million open windows on your computer and then going to type an email and the email is like 20 spaces behind, like the cursor won't catch up to your typing. And that's what most of us are doing with our brains and bodies. It's like, we just, we're not fully present. We're not fully capable. We're not fully intuitive because we've got so much of our energy in the past and the future. Yeah. You know, it's really incredible how things that could have happened in our past or things that did happen in our past can even affect us today. And we really have no idea. So I can imagine with developing meditation practice, you didn't even realize like how bad you were feeling, right? Like once you start meditating and you start feeling so much better, you're like, oh my God, I didn't even realize how, you know, I was in a fog or just how stressed I was before. Mm, Yes, I think that's very true. And a lot of people will say, you know, it's like once they start Ziva, it's like, oh, I didn't know I needed glasses. And then I got glasses and everything came into clear focus. Or if you've ever been to LA, you know, LA is like always a little bit smoggy and a little bit hazy. It's still beautiful and sunny, but then it rains, you know, the rare rain in Los Angeles. And the next day is like crystal clear and so sharp and everything feels so vibrant and alive and green. And that to me is like meditation where you're like, oh, it's like you just wipe that fog of stress away from your lens of perception, which, you know, that fog of stress is not so thin for many of us. And when we're stressed, it's hard for us to see things for what they are because our eyes are clouded by longing. You know, we always, we see things through the lens of what we want them to be versus the lens of what they are. And it's very easy to make mistakes when we're looking at life with how we want things to be versus how they are. (laughs) You know, it's like you might end up marrying the wrong person or taking, saying yes to the wrong job or just making any number of mistakes because you had a mistake. You took something to be one thing when it was actually something else. And many of us do that when our eyes are clouded by longing. And what the meditation does is that because it's giving you access to your bliss and fulfillment in the only place that they reside, which is inside of you, then when you come out of the meditation, it's wiped some of that longing away from your lens of perception so you can start to see things more accurately for what they are. And that in turn makes you less likely to make a mistake. And that's one of the reasons why meditators start to perform so much higher. It's why they start to have more time in their day because they're not making mistakes as often. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the other benefits. So one of the benefits that I keep hearing over and over again is that I have more time in my day. So even Mm -hmm. Dr. Hyman wrote your forward and he said, I finally put in 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening to meditation and I got back three hours. So that's definitely a huge statement. So can you talk a little bit about that? And then what are some of the other real physical benefits that we can see and what changes are going to happen even like to our brain, for example, when we start meditating regularly? Yeah. So I love this. As you're right, Mark Hyman, he's a Ziva graduate. He's become a dear friend. He wrote the forward to the book. And his big quote now is like, I don't have time not to meditate. And Mark is an 11 time New York Times bestselling author running the Cleveland Center for Functional Medicine. He's a father. He's speaking all around the world. Like, you know, he busy, right? And my favorite quote is like, if Oprah has time to meditate, you have time to meditate. And if you listen to Tim Ferriss, he says that 90% of his podcast guests all start their day with meditation. And he's 
famous for interviewing the world's highest performers. So these people are not meditating because they have copious amounts of extra time to burn. They're doing it because it's making them more productive. They're doing it because they are getting a return on their investment. And, you know, I've taught Oscar, Grammy, Tony, Emmy Award winners, CEOs, NBA basketball players, Navy SEALs. And again, they're not doing it because they're like, um, I've got an hour to waste today. Let me just piddle around meditating. It's like they're doing it to sharpen their brain function. They're doing it to increase their cognitive performance. And so the reason why meditation gives you more time is basically what I was saying with that fight or flight thing. If you're constantly preparing for a tiger attack and yet none of your daily demands are tigers, then you're wasting your physical and mental energy. So you're not as present in the here and now to accomplish things as elegantly or as quickly or even as serendipitously as you could if you're taking your right brain to the gym. Also, your sleep becomes more efficient. So this sort of answers your second question, but it also speaks to the time piece because most of us are using our sleep as a time for stress release. Our sleep is not that efficient. And anyone who's doing like body data monitoring or sleep tracking, if you look at your sleep, it probably looks like hills and valleys. It's light, medium, deep, wake up, light, medium, deep, wake up. After most people start Ziva, their sleep goes light, medium, deep for six hours, medium, light, wake up. So the amount that they're actually in deep sleep increases, the numbers of times as they wake up throughout the night decreases, so their sleep is becoming much more efficient. Now what's happening there is that they're inserting two times a day for stress release, so their body uses the meditation time for stress release so that they can actually use their sleep as a time for sleep. So many people report needing less sleep but feeling more refreshed on the other side. So if all meditation did for you was shave one hour off of the sleep that you need at night, then you already have 30 extra minutes in your day, right? Because you've made a 30-minute time investment, 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. And if it's giving you one hour of sleep back, then you're 30 minutes in the black. And that's to say nothing of you know how much more creative you are, how much less resistance you have, how much less time you're spending wasting speculating and ruminating about the past and rehearsing the future or you know judging yourself or criticizing yourself or belittling yourself, which is what stress does to us. <laughs> it makes all those things non-negotiable. So the sleep will give you more time and also your immune system gets stronger, right? So if you're not taking as many sick days, if you're not getting sick as often, that's going to give you days back of your life. If you're not spending so much energy freaking out about getting a cold and like taking all the remedies in the land, it's like, that's going to give you some time back. Another thing is that meditation, you asked about some other benefits. One of the big ones is that it can reverse your body age and different studies are saying different things. Some studies are saying it can reverse your body age as much as eight years. Others are saying as much as 15 years. And like that sounds like a fountain of youth and it sounds like magical fakeness, but it's, it actually is real. And if you want proof of that, look at any president the day they take office and that same president four years later. Yeah. You know, it's like they all age on They're years. all gray. Like, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we like, just know even like, you know, people joke sometimes, right? Or if you go to a high school or reunion or a college reunion, and then there's always that one person that has really aged beyond their time, right? Like they age much faster than everyone else. And it's usually the ones that have had, you know, we'll say something like, oh, they've had a hard life, right? So we kind of know, like it makes sense that when we're with, you know, negative emotions or having a really hard time and having a ton of stress, it does age us. But it was really interesting to read it in your book. And even you had written how it increases the acidity in our body and our skin, which could actually age our skin as well. Mm, Yes. That acidity on your skin, it breaks down like skin elasticity. And we all know it, like even in our own lives, like if you are like, you know, launching a new company or writing a book or, you know, doing something really intense or you've gone through a divorce or you're pulling all nighters at work. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, Oh God, I look tired. I look old. I look haggard. Versus if you go on vacation and you're doing yoga every day and having sex every day and eating delicious, fresh food and getting sun, you're like, Oh, I look amazing. You know, I feel fresh and vibrant. And there's a whole chapter in the book called the legit fountain of youth. But I start it by saying like, why are we chasing youth? when really what we want to be chasing is health. And I think that's what most of us are doing. We just got a little confused. We got our wires crossed. It's like we're chasing that glow that comes with youth. We're chasing that vibrance that comes with youth. But I think so let's just get specific about what we're chasing. Let's chase the vibrance and the glow, not youth. Because you could have 
like a 65 year old doing plastic surgery to make them look like they're 20 is not going to look 20. They're going to look like a 65 year old with plastic surgery. And so it's like, what if we instead like do these practices to make us feel our best at whatever age we are, right? Because we've all seen the 60 year old yogi who's been meditating right. every day and doing yoga every day that has like tight, strong skin, amazing muscular arms, vibrant, clear eyes. And you're like, ooh, I want that. And they, they look their age, but they look vibrant and strong and healthy. Right. And you know, and I always say it's a very Western idea that when you get old, you get sick and you die, right? Like we have this perception that the older you get, the worse things get. Like I remember being terrified of turning 30 because I thought like that was the end of my life. Like I'd be so old when I was 30 years old. And, yeah. you know, we just put so much emphasis on youth. And I actually even remember being 21 years old in a club in New York and some guy telling me like, oh, I'm too old now. Like no guy's going to want me because I'm 21. I'm like, you know, and it just, society always just throws these messages on us. So of course, like I think age stresses us out, but it's true. It's not the number that, you know, that we want. It's just the peace, the calmness, the happiness that I feel like we're actually after. Mm, I agree. And, and also like the joy, it's, it's so funny because it's so easy for humans to think that their happiness lives anywhere other than where they are. You know, it's like when we're young, we think, oh, well, when I grow up, when I have freedom, then I will be happy. You know, when I'm 21, I can go out drinking legally, like then I will be happy. But then when we get older, we think, you know, oh, back when I was in my 20s, that's when I was happy. That's when life was really good. You know, that's back in the day when I could just go out and not worry about my, putting my kid to bed and all my tax bills, my mortgage, like then life was really great. And any of those is really just the I'll be happy when syndrome. You know, I'll be happy when blank happens. And there's a whole chapter in the book called that as well, the I'll be happy when syndrome. And the only antidote to that is finding your happiness in the only place that it resides, which is right here, right now. And I just think that anything we're chasing, youth, money, relationships, more social media followers, you know, whatever you're chasing, we're not chasing the thing itself. We're chasing the feeling that we hope that achievement will bring. And the thing I love about meditation is that it's quite literally flooding your brain and body with dopamine and serotonin. So it's giving you access to that feeling right here, right now. And I think a, a lot of high achievers and high performers are concerned that once they have the ability to do that, well, then I'll just sit around and wallow around in my bliss all day and I'll never go to work again. But usually people who are afraid of that are very motivated by competition or stress or angst. You know, they're moving away from the pain and not towards the pleasure. They're like, well, I have to beat someone or I have to get there first or they kind of constructed their lives on achievement in an unsustainable way. But what I have found is that if you wake up and flood your brain and body with dopamine and serotonin and access your happiness internally right here, right now, it actually makes you more motivated and you actually achieve more, but it's in a sustainable way that you're doing it in a way that doesn't kill you or the people around you. And not only is that more enjoyable, but I think that you know, as millennials are becoming the people who are the primary, you know, workforce. And as there's this rising of the divine feminine, you know, the old school sort of patriarchal, very militaristic ways of doing business are not necessarily going to go away, but they're not going to be the only way anymore. Like there's just more of a sharing economy. There is more of this idea of lifting each other up. There's this idea that of this feminine, like we all have access to the divine and we can all be channels for the divine versus a more like patriarchal, masculine of like guru, student, lineage. So things are shifting. And I think that as we start to find our happiness internally, it allows us, and this isn't, this is not gender specific. I think that men and women can both do this, but we all can sort of get in touch with this femininity inside of us, this connectedness, this intuition, this ability to feel and experience our happiness right here, right now, and then bring that to everything that we do instead of just hard driving, achieving, accomplishing, hoping that we'll be happy on the other side of our to-do list. A hundred percent. One other benefit that I found really interesting in the book was you talked a little bit about how meditation can actually change your brain. And specifically, it can shrink the amygdala, which is the brain's fear center. So people who meditate are not experiencing that same anxiety and fear on that consistent basis as maybe someone who's not, right? 
Mm, yes. So when we get stressed and we launch into that involuntary fight or flight thing, a lot of brain, a lot of energy, a lot of blood goes to the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain. It's sort of that like reptilian old school, like pre-verbal part of us. And when you start meditating every day, not only do you get out of fight or flight, which takes that blood and energy away from the amygdala, but we move into what I call stay and play. And then we start to get access to the prefrontal cortex, which is the executive function of the brain, which we can reason with that is in charge of language. And that basically gives you a fighting chance of getting to choose how you want to respond to things. It gives you a fighting chance of acting in accordance with what you already know to be true. And then what we know over time is that when you're meditating, you're taking your right brain to the gym, whereas most of us are sort of in that left brain past future. And in the beginning, the pendulum can swing a little bit where it's like all right brain and people get a little foggy and a little cloudy and just a little out of sorts. And then over time, it's like we start firing on all cylinders, right and left hemispheres of the brain start functioning in unison. And then over time, we can strengthen something called the corpus callosum, which is the thin white strip that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. And this is important because the corpus callosum is really the bridge between the critical mind and the creative mind. It's the bridge between your past and future and your present moment. And it is the thing that allows you to come up with those creative problem-solving ideas, even in the middle of a high-demand situation. And so really, we want a thick corpus callosum. It's interesting. I recently learned, and I'm not 100% sure if this is true, so feel free to fact check me, but I heard that when they did an autopsy on Einstein, that his brain, that he virtually had like no corpus callosum, like at all, and that might seem antithetical to what I'm saying, but I don't think that it is. But basically it's like because it was almost not there at all, it's like the right and left hemispheres of his brain were totally touching and conjoined. So it was almost like he had the fattest corpus callosum because... <laughs> he was living in between this critical mind and this creative mind. And so much of the math and the physics that he was doing was creative. You know, he was solving problems that we haven't even really come to understand fully yet. I think just like two years ago, we finally were able to prove one of his theories true, like many years posthumously. And so basically for those of us who are not Einstein and those of us who are not, you know, bonafide geniuses, we want to make sure that we have the ability to access our intuition even when we're in the middle of a high stakes situation. And for most of us, it's sort of either or. Like we can be intuitive and creative if we're home, safe, listening to music with some candles on. But when we're pitching the board, we just have to like have our bullets and have it memorized and stay very left brain. And I'm arguing that let's choose both. You know, let's use all of these tools that nature has given us. Right. Yeah. And I mean, in the book, you had so many examples and research behind all of these amazing benefits of meditation. And earlier you mentioned, though, that there's really three types. The one that we do probably or most people are familiar with is the mindfulness type, which is sort of like the guided meditations or the apps. But can you talk a little bit about the other two and what your meditation practice is? Sure. So Ziva is a trifecta of mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting, the three M's as we like to call it. And what I found is that the combination of these three really is what helps people to perform at the top of their game and to get better at better at life. So I think we meditate to get good at life, not to get good at meditation. Now, like I was saying earlier, where this gets confusing is that what most people are practicing and what's really, really popular right now is, is actually mindfulness. So a lot of the quote unquote meditation apps out there are actually teaching what I would call mindfulness and which is the art of bringing your awareness into the present moment. So anytime someone's guiding you, anytime you're doing breath work or visualizing something, that's all great, but it's keeping you in your left brain realm of thinking. Whereas the meditation that I teach at Ziva, which is the second M, this type of meditation is all about getting rid of stress from the past. It's all about like a deep, healing, restful surrender. Like you're giving your body rest that's five times deeper than sleep. And the practice itself is very lazy. It's very simple. It's very effortless. It feels kind of like a nap sitting up. But the nap is not just like sleep. It's actually more restful than sleep. And then on the other side, you're more awake. You're more energized. 
and you've gone in and de-excited the nervous system, which helps to create order in your cells. And it is that function that allows the lifetime of stresses to start to come up and out. So mindfulness, we use in Ziva sort of like a runway as an appetizer into the main course, which is this deep, restful, surrendered meditation practice. And then we move into the third M, which is manifesting, which is really simply consciously creating a life you love. It's you getting intentional about what you want your life to look like. And we could have called it, you know, creative visualization, which there's been a ton of science done on, but you know, I like alliteration and the three M's is sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> and what I found though is that the combination of meditation and manifesting is so much more powerful than either one alone. Like, cause you know, you could meditate all day, but if you're not clear about what you want, then it's hard for nature to bring you the thing. And conversely, you could manifest all day, but if you're not meditating, then your body is probably riddled with stress and you may not believe that you deserve your desires. And so what we do with the manifesting is we take the few minutes right after the meditation where the right and left hemispheres of the brain are functioning in unison and we start to plant the seeds for what we want in our lives. Like starting to ask questions like, you know, how much money do I want to make this year? What does my relationship with my body feel like? My dream relationship with my body. Um, how much sex do I want to be having in a month? What does my dream vacation look like? And we start to ask these better questions so that we get better answers versus what a lot of us are doing is that we think we're manifesting or we think we're praying or accidentally complaining. And it's like, why can't I lose this weight? When am I going to get a boyfriend? Why did she get a raise and I didn't? And then we're accidentally watering the weeds, right? When what we want to be doing is watering the flowers. And the definition of stress is the space between where you are and where you think you should be. That's the definition of stress. And we don't want to pour our attention on that. Instead, we want to pour our attention on the flowers, on the things that we want to grow. So we take that sacred time at the end of the meditation and we start to imagine our dreams as if they're happening now. And I find that, especially since I work with high achievers and high performers, it's like, Yes, they're quote unquote wasting their time with the meditation, but then they get to hitch that steam engine up to their dreams. And sometimes it helps them to stay in the saddle until the return on investment feels obvious and non negotiable. Yeah. And I find this third M so fascinating and between manifestation and even intuition, because this is something that has come up on the show a few times before with intuition. And a lot of times people will, will tell me that they feel like they don't actually know what like they can't listen to their intuition or they're not hearing their intuition because they feel just so very disconnected from it. So I think that, you know, there's kind of this sense or the feeling like, oh, I should just, you know, I should have intuition and it should just be readily available. But I guess sometimes because we are so stressed and anxious, like it, somehow we tune it out and then it's up to us to kind of clear out all that noise, all that white noise to kind of actually hear it again. Yes. And I think, I think you're right. A lot of people don't even know what their intuition is because it's very hard to hear that little whisper of intuition if your critical mind is screaming at you. You know, it's very hard to hear that little whisper of like, write that book. Oh my God. When your left brain is like, I suck, I suck, I suck. I'm going to die alone with cats eating my face. <laughs> and because most of us are so stressed and that left brain is so overdeveloped and we're so good at thinking and taking action and achieving and making money so we can be happy in the future, it's very hard. Most of us don't even know what the intuition voice sounds like because the critical mind is screaming so loudly. And so to me, it's not about clearing the mind or trying to get the fear to go away or stopping the left brain from happening. It's just about turning down the volume a little bit and then turning up the volume on your intuitive voice so that you can choose which one of those you want to listen to. You know, in my experience, the fear never goes away, you know, and that's there. It's the thing that's keeping you alive. It's the thing that makes you not walk out in the middle of the street or jump off of a building because it'd be fun for 30 seconds to free fall. You know, it's like we need that critical voice. We do need that fear. It's just gotten out of balance. And it, I really think it's because if you look at a human brain, it splits right down the middle, 50-50. And I don't think that nature makes mistakes. I don't think nature would have given us 50-50 if we wanted us to use 90-10. And yet that's what most of us are doing. You know, we've been trained with our schools and with our, you know, modern life. And because we've really gone into the age of thinking and this technological age, whereas even a hundred years ago, it was more about like hunting and farming and gathering. And we were much more physical and connected to the earth. And this was a much more 
grounded experience being a human. But now we don't have to touch the earth. We don't have to hunt our food. We don't have to clean our food. We don't have to, we're so separated from the earth and from our food. And we've gone so up in our heads and in our brains. And so the meditation, while it might seem like a mental activity, it's actually connecting you back with your body. It's grounding you down. And that's where our intuition lives. It lives in our gut. And I'm so glad that this whole like health and functional medicine conversation has started to shift into the microbiome, into the gut. And now we're starting to know that you get 12 times as many messages from your gut to your brain as you do from your brain to your gut. And so it's, I just think it's great that we're starting to understand just how holistic this system is. Because if you try to just heal one or the other, you know, I'll just meditate and then I'll eat Twinkies for dinner. It's like, well, it's not going to be a great plan. And if you just are dealing with the food and the body, but not dealing with your mental health, that's not going to work either. Like it really is a symbiotic system. I don't remember the original point, but here we are. (laughs) No, no, I mean, it's so true. And I'm also really glad that it's all coming together and we're starting to look at health more holistically. I think a lot of us will get into the health and wellness world through one modality. So for example, for me, I got into it through food and food made a huge impact on my life and completely transformed my health. But as I continue to eat healthy, I realized, wait a minute, I'm still not 100% healthy, right? Because if I'm not happy, or, you know, I'm stressed or anxious, or I'm not working out, you know, there's other factors to health beyond just the food part. So it really is our body, our mind, it's all connected. And so we need to make sure that we're doing the practices that serve each of those parts of us. Yes. And the way I like to think about it is like, there's like the health and wellness train and people get on it and different doors, you know, some people like you get on the food door and like, it's really revelatory that way. Or like me, you get on, on the train through the meditation door, but once you're on the train, like you're going to find all the other pillars, you know, cause it's like, now you're on the train. So it doesn't really matter which door you got there through. It's like, now we just got to make sure we're all moving in the same direction towards vitality. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So I think by this point, everyone listening is like, all right, I'm going to meditate. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's so many benefits. And if you read the book, I mean, we're even not even touching, I feel like half of the things that I learned in this book in terms of benefits. But can you offer some practical tips for meditation and how we can start incorporating that into our life? Sure. So I'm happy to share like some techniques that you can use if you're getting into like a stressful situation or in you're having a panic attack or an anxiety attack. I can teach you something called the 2x breath, which is just a really powerful but simple way to get out of fight or flight, to calm the vagus nerve, to get back in your body. But that's like a breathing technique. And the thing about meditation is that it really is a skill. And because it's simple, I think I said this, you know, people think they should already know how to do it. But I really think that if the most practical tip I could give you if you want to start a meditation practice is know that it is a skill. And so don't assume that you should already know how to do it. Like I think, you know, spend the time, like read the book or I have an online course that's only like 20, 25 minutes a day for 15 days. And it's a matriculation. It's like once you graduate, you're going to have the keys to the car and the driving instructions and you're going to have these tools to take with you for life. You'll be self-sufficient. And to just kind of throw yourself in the water and, and not have any swimming instructions, you might swim, you might figure it out, but you might also drown. You know, you might just flounder and be frustrated or get out of the water because it feels too hard. And so, you know, swimming is pretty simple, but if you don't have a swimming instructor, then, you know, it's just not as enjoyable. So yes, I'd say the most practical piece is don't expect yourself to know somebody to know how to do something that you've never been taught. Right. And of course, like you always want to seek out guidance and instead of floundering, doing things on your own, if you can find someone who's an expert at what you want to be doing, it always makes sense to do that. So whether it's SIVA or whether it's reading the book, stress less, accomplish more, whatever you want to do, don't try and just sit there by yourself and clear your thoughts. Like try to find someone who could actually show you the way to do it most effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like find a teacher that you trust and you respect. I mean, if you can learn face-to-face, I think that's awesome. Not everybody has access to a teacher, which is why I made the online course. And then, you know, the book is also like people are, we're now, the book came out six weeks ago and I have a a thing called the Ziva Tribe on Facebook, which is open to anybody. And but I, like, you know, we have 11,000 people in there and it's so, it's been so fun to watch people's experiences where they're like, they've actually moved through a lot of physical and emotional detox and they haven't had anxiety attacks and their sleep is better. So, I mean, it is even from the book, like it is working and it is effective, which is exciting. 
But the two X breath is really simple. So this, you simply inhale through your nose for two and you exhale through your mouth for four. And we can all do it together as you're listening. So inhale for two and exhale through your mouth for four. Inhaling for two and exhaling for four. And if you're really stressed, you could do this walking around the room. You know, you could inhale for two steps and exhale for four. Um, or you could do it seated, but it's so, so simple. But it's a great way to just get yourself right out of fight or flight. And something about that, like doubling the length of the exhale from the inhale, helps to calm and strengthen the vagus nerve. Yeah. No, I actually did this. I was reading the book on the plane and this exercise was in the book. So I was like, oh, let me just try it for two minutes. And I wasn't in a particularly stressful situation, but just after the two minutes, you do feel really calm. And it's so amazing how something as simple as breathing really has the ability to calm us down so much. And I think, yeah, if we can just remember that in a stressful situation, all we have to do is breathe. Yes. And, you know, it's like, a lot of techniques and practices use the breath as their way in. We don't really focus on it too much at Ziva, but I do like to use it as a, as a preamble. But the reason why breath work and meditation oftentimes will go hand in hand is that your breathing and your thoughts are two things that happen autonomically and you can get your hands on the wheel. You know, So it's like you're going to think and breathe all day no matter what, whether you're conscious of it or not. And you can go in and manipulate both things a little bit. So if you start to manipulate the breath a bit and slow it down, that can sometimes take you out of that excited panic mode. Right. So one last question that I like to ask everyone on the show is if you can leave our listeners with just one tip or one piece of advice to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? Well, I always feel like this is a trick question because mine is, you know, obviously like you got to meditate. Like it's, it's got to be the number one non-negotiable, but let's say that's a given. And then right after that, I would say the tip would be just this concept. It's originally a roomy quote, but we have an adaptation of it painted on our wall at Ziva. And it says, what you seek is in you. What you seek is in you. The kingdom of heaven is within. You know, we're all looking for this stuff outside of ourselves. We're all seeking it externally. But really, it's always found internally. And the trick is that if you find your bliss and fulfillment internally, then you can start to use every aspect of your life as a means by which to deliver that fulfillment instead of going through your life trying to fill yourself up. And one is infinitely more enjoyable than the other. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for having me. What a joy. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for sharing your wisdom today. For anyone listening who wants to check out the book, again, it's Stress Less, Accomplish More. And if you want to learn more about Emily and her meditation technique, you can head to zivameditation.com. That's Z-I-V-A meditation.com. Or you can also find her all over social media at Ziva Meditation. 